Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to this mini course by Professor David Sozon on resurgence theory. Um, and this is the second lecture. So over to you, David, you can continue. Thank you, good morning, and thank you again for this wonderful opportunity. So where were we? Uh, yesterday, we, the picture you have to keep in mind, let me put it over there, is this triangle um, where the function is obtained as Laplace transform of another function, which is itself obtained by Borel transform from a series. So here the variable is at infinity and there is this asymptotic expansion property. Yes, there exists asymptotic expansion at infinity. Now, this is something we will state clearly today. I mean, but I mentioned it like that incidentally yesterday as a motivation. So uh, Laplace transform, um, Laplace transform, well, the usual formula, you know it, it's uh, integral from zero to infinity of exponential minus z zeta phi hat of zeta d zeta. But you can, well, usually you use plus infinity, positive real half line, but why not use any ray? So I put a theta here to remember the direction along which I am computing my integral. And um, okay, so that's where we are going. And well, now let me mention very clearly that a particular case is the case of monomials. Zeta power nu, not necessarily integer. What you need about nu is just, you need a thing to be integrable at the origin. So you need, um, you need, well, by the way, it's rather gamma of nu, nu minus one here, and you need real part of nu positive. So that you see the, the growth at the origin makes it integrable. And then the formula is this. So this is our motivation to define the Borel transform like this. So let me, let me start here, okay. So that will be, we defined it yesterday. So today we have more on the Borel transform. So this Borel transform, so I recall it was defined for formal series with indeterminate uh, at infinity negative powers. Non well, and then it costs nothing to accept uh, an extra power like that. So here, but here for integrability reason, we, we assume real part of beta positive. And the definition, you have your expansion. Um, well, let me write it like this. So really precisely in that case, nu is running over, um, what is it, beta plus non-negative integers. And then the, the result is, by definition, you just use this formula. You divide, you divide by your factorial or gamma factor. Um, and so you can think of it and you must think of it as, a, as of an inverse, a term-wise inverse Laplace transform. That's the motivation. So when you um, mentioned that, uh, you are assuming theta is in the right, uh, in the right half, uh, like theta is between zero and phi or something? Uh, no, no, it's anywhere. I mean, this formula, well. But because the, the other one, isn't there a branch cut uh, if you go to the negative axis? Uh, you're right, there is the, I mean, this formula implicitly is on the Riemann surface of the logarithm for zeta, I mean, as if nu is non-integer. Yes. Zeta is on the Riemann surface of the logarithm and theta has better be than a real number. And Z as well is on the Riemann surface. So yes, I can tell you this already. If my theta is any real number 
and I'm working on the Riemann surface of the logarithm. So this means I know which branch of this multi-valued function I am manipulating. And when they are multi-valued, no problem, but just be careful with the branch because this can be the source of confusion. You're choosing the branch such that so you choose the branch like that. And theta is a real number. And then, so this is the zeta plane. And then in the z plane, really it's advisable to take minus theta, a real number again, and to consider this half plane where real part of z exponential i theta is positive. Here you just need, in this formula, you plug the monomial, at the origin, you have integrability, but at infinity, you need the Laplace kernel to beat the, growth, the potential growth at infinity. Well, it's a monomial, no problem, but you, at least you need it to be decaying. And to have the Laplace kernel decaying, I recall you that the modulus of an exponential is the exponential of the real part. So we have minus modulus of zeta um, and real part of z exponential i theta. So I need this real part to be positive. And this defines me a half plane on the Riemann surface of the logarithm. That's how I avoid confusion. So if I change the branch here, I must change the half plane right? because I, I'm changing the, the theta by an inch by an two pi or minus two pi. Um, we will come back to that question of growth at infinity and the domain. But of course, you can vary theta and then you vary your half plane. And this formula is true virtually everywhere. <laughs> so you are not uh, stuck to one particular half plane. But just the formula does not make sense if Z is not in that half plane. The, the formula, the integral formula, what makes sense is the analytic continuation of the function you have defined, which is slightly different. So that's for monomials. Now, this is term-wise inverse Laplace transform for monomials, even accepting non-integer powers. Um, and what else? Uh, what else should I say right now? Yes, particular case, particular case, uh, beta equal one. Uh, and then we saw that it's a pity to miss the constant terms. So what will, we, what will you do if you have a constant term? Yeah, you can just say that this is constants plus this guy, this space. And so you just declared that the, you just declared that the Borel transform of one is delta or Dirac, which you may think of as a distribution. And then Laplace transform of this distribution is one because there is no function, no monomial, no function I mean, genuine analytic function whose Laplace transform would give you one. That's impossible. It will be clear in a moment. So you need a symbol. Um, uh, standard properties, uh, very important. What is the Borel transform of a derivative? So we are in this space or, or that one. So you have a well-defined D over DZ. It's multiplication by Zeta. So multiplication by Zeta, yes. Field. With the convention that Dirac multiplied by Zeta is zero. Um, what is the um, Borel transform of the shift operator I mean, imagine you have a complex number C. Because we are working with formal expansion at infinity, this is defined. At the origin, it would not. I mean, you, you know that you cannot substitute a formal series inside another one unless the constant term is vanishing. But when you interpret that in variable T, one over Z, you understand that Z plus C becomes 
T over one plus CT, something like that. So, I mean, it makes sense to substitute. Another way of saying it is that you can define this by a formally convergent series. I mean, use formally the Taylor expansion. So this is, this you can take as a definition because d over dz for series at infinity, it increases the order, it increases the valuation. So this is formally convergent. We have, because when you try to, co to compute one particular coefficient, one, so you, you fix a monomial and you wonder what is the coefficient in front of it, you will select only finitely many terms because most of the terms will be higher than that particular exponent you have you are looking at so this is called formal convergence or convergence for the topology of the z adic uh, um, topology yes the z adic topology i mean whatever it's very concrete very clear so this is well defined and by the way this formula suggests you what the result will be it will be multiplication by exponential minus c zeta because you are iterating this and then doing the sum so it's again a multiplication operator okay uh, and another one oh yes what about multiplication by z multiplication by z what is it the borel transform the borel counterpart it's integration from zero so you compute the primitive which vanishes vanishes at the origin of the borel transform and if you, in the case of the constant term it works because you interpret it as a distribution. So the integral is well defined, I suppose. I hope it works. Uh, you find zero as, as it should be because the, this guy has no constant term. So. <laughs> okay, uh, more generally, I mean, this is a multiplication. Very important. What is the Borel transform of a product? So let's suppose, to, I mean, there is no issue with the unit. <laughs> So let us suppose that both of them are um, without constant term for the sake of simplicity, or we can even accept this, but, but real part of beta is positive. So, which means that formally this tends to zero at infinity. The, the trouble with the unit is that it does not tend to zero. So that's the true issue. This is why we need this symbol, etc. So now, uh, I'm forgetting that symbol because I'm dealing with the product and the unit is not an issue. So let us suppose we have two uh, formally uh, vanishing at infinity expansions and we don't even need the same beta there. I mean, okay. it's, so the result is convolution. So what is convolution with by definition, so now we are taking the convolution of two formal series. These two guys live in that space. So you define it by that formula. Well, you def yes, this is what you compute when you. So this is my definition of convolution. So zeta one psi of zeta minus zeta one. So here, with formal series, it makes sense term-wise. So this is term-wise integration. For formal series in general, if they happen to be convergent, which is the case of interest for us. I mean, here I'm doing this general business, but we will focus on those for which the Borel transform happens to have to define a holomorphic germ near the origin. So if they happen to be convergent, then you can make sense of these functions at least for zeta one small enough and zeta of z minus zeta one small enough. So it makes sense for zeta of modulus small enough. 
So it's genuine integration of functions if uh, they happen to be convergent and zeta modulus of zeta is small enough very important condition because resurgence is about analytic continuation so you are happy you have an integral formula it makes sense for zeta small enough but probably the analytic continuation will exist but probably it won't be given anymore by that simple formula. Okay. And my final remark about the Borel transform before moving to uh, Laplace transform is the following. Uh, what about the convergent case? I mean, I mentioned that we will be interested in uh, those which give rise to convergent germs. So these are convergent series. Well, maybe there is a zeta to the beta minus one in front. No problem. So what is this? This is the Borel image precisely of those which are one Gevre. Remember the gro factorial growth, at most factorial growth for the nth coefficient. I mean, that's a triviality. And well, again, it's a triviality, but among them, you find the convergent ones. Convergent. Those which have a positive radius of convergence in variable z. I mean, why do I mean? Let me take a concrete example. Uh, I mean, let's take beta equal to one. So I'm, what I'm, when I write convergent, I mean precisely um, power series in negative powers of Z with a positive radius of convergence. So which means in the T variable, I would have a disk. And um, so my, my series here is like this. So I can, I can yes, shift. And like this, and I'm just saying that modulus of a n is less than c m power n. And yes, indeed, in the t variable, the t, the radius of convergence is at least one over m. So in the z variable, this guy is convergent for modulus of z at least m, larger than m. So I have a holomorphic function at infinity, vanishing at infinity because there is no constant term. So think on, on the Riemann surface of the, sorry, on the Riemann sphere, I have a disk at infinity, simply. And um, what about the Borel transform then? What is this? What is the Borel image? So I mean, okay, beta is one, I'm, I'm here. What is the Borel image? Yeah. Well, it's a very easy lemma, a fact. Um, um, this phi tilde is, so phi, phi of z here, this phi of z is convergent if and only if it's Borel transform phi hat is, defines so this holomorphic germ, I mean, it's, it's convergent, but not only convergent near the origin, it's entire, it defines an entire function of bounded exponential, uh, bounded exponential type. I mean, implicitly I'm saying it's order at one, something, uh, so what do I mean? Well, do the, do the math, do the computation. Um, we are dividing by the factorial. So, I mean, this indeed, I had is simply this series. And now I'm saying an over factorial n is less than 
CMN over factorial N. Hence, yes, the series is absolutely convergent for any zeta, and you find an exponential bound like this. So this is what is called um, bounded exponential type, bounded by M concretely. But I mean, I never said that M was optimal, of course. So entire functions of bounded exponential type are those coming from convergent series. And of course, if there is a beta, you have to modify it slightly, but it's the same philosophy. No divergence appears, uh, sorry, no singularity appears in the Borel plane, in the zeta variable. Okay. So now we move to the Laplace transform. Oh, I could write here, probably. You told me you could read me here. Uh, so the Laplace transform. So I defined it already. What do I want to say next? Mm. So let me take theta equals zero to start with. And then here is a proposition, a theorem. Okay, theorem. Um, so the Laplace transform of in direction zero of A zero Dirac plus uh, phi hat. Yes, let me use this notation. Now, um, phi hat will be my function. Uh, it will be, it will come from a convergent germ in zeta and A zero is the coefficient of Dirac. And I compute Laplace transform. So, of course, my motivation is this uh, triangle. So this is why I'm pointing to the Borel transform. But okay, now we start with any A zero complex number. We start with a function phi zero, phi hat of zeta. So which is convergent at the origin, but not only. I mean, I want, I define this like this, I repeat. I define it like this. So clearly I need my function to be defined on, uh, sorry that I have decided to choose theta equal to zero. So I need, if I had to have an analytic continuation at least along R plus. Well, let's say it has analytic continuation in this half strip. Um, well, you have the disk and let's say there is a half strip like this centered on R plus. So this is the zeta plane and I have this delta. So I'm considering those zetas such that their distance to are non-negative is less than delta or equal. I mean, I don't mind open or closed. Um, delta is not very relevant here. So I assume to make sense of that formula, I assume my phi hat to be analytic, to have analytic continuation and to have at most exponential growth at infinity such that phi hat of zeta is less than uh, constant exponential m zeta uh, for zeta large enough, um, let's say for zeta larger than one, for fixed constants c and m, m could be negative by the way, it's even better. <laughs> Uh, in that case, so the, what is the statement? So theorem, I define a function like that. Uh, so these are my assumptions, assuming all that. And I define a function of Z. Uh, let me emphasize it's a function of Z defined by an integral. It is, this function, 
is analytic or holomorphic. I mean, complex analytic. I mean, I do not distinguish analytic and holomorphic here. In the half plane, real part of Z larger than M so that Laplace kernel beats the potential growth of phi hat. And has asymptotic expansion. So it's analytic and it has asymptotic expansion at infinity and has um, asymptotic expansion um, which is uh, which is the inverse Borel transform of A0 delta plus phi hat. So this series, which is simply A0 plus so you take the Taylor expansion of phi hat at zero. So it starts with phi hat of zero. And you have inverse Borel transform of one is Z inverse. And then the next term is phi hat derivative, Z minus two. But the next term, I emphasize that there is no factorial here because the factorial which was in the Taylor series has been removed by the inverse Borel transform. So, so usually you know very well, but from Cauchy inequalities, my phi hat is holomorphic in the disk. This, this sequence of derivatives, it, grow, it can grow at most factorially. So you, you see that indeed this series grows at is Gevray one, one Gevray. So this is my statement, very important now. I have a question. Uh, question? Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Yeah, so this uh, Laplace transform integral that you have defined zero to infinity to the Z Xi phi hat Xi D Xi. If phi hat Xi is of the form e to the M Xi, then isn't that integral divergent? Sorry, I didn't catch. Can you repeat the end of the question? So if, if phi hat xi, as you, as you have said, phi hat xi is of the form c e to the m xi, right? Is, is less, than, less than or equal to c e to the m xi. Phi hat xi is of the form c e to the m xi, right? So that's why the, it is, uh, he's asking, I think, about the boundedness. Uh, so that's why I think the condition real Z is greater than M. Oh, yes. This yes. is, yes, this is, a, I mean, we've shown, we've seen that in a particular case, M equals zero, so to speak, or M arbitrarily small. Yes, yeah, sorry, let me repeat it. Uh, the point is that I need this to be integrable at the origin, no problem. What about infinity? I mean, really, can I reach this bound? Uh, I use simply the fact that here I have real part of Z zeta. So I can fact, I mean, zeta is positive. Zeta is positive here. And then I have real part of Z. And here I have M zeta. Zeta is positive. And I've, but I put the minus in front, so I have a minus. Because I, <clears throat> I need this coefficient, real part of Z minus M, to be positive so as to ensure integrability at infinity. No, so, so I, I miss the minus in front of E to the minus Z zeta. So if it's minus Z, it's okay. I thought it was, I, I missed the minus. Yes, the Laplace kernel has this minus. Yeah, By definition, okay. this makes life easier, as you can see. And if you don't put the minus, then you have... <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's let's not change everything in the tradition. I mean, Laplace transform. Um, yeah. What if phi hat is not convergent? Phi hat is divergent itself. Oh, uh, what if phi hat is divergent? Then you cannot compute its Laplace transform. You cannot do anything of that kind. You need to do something else. So. 
Maybe it means that your Borel transform was not powerful enough to make it convergent. You know, it, there is the idea that the, the Borel transform is like a, a lens, like a zoom. I mean, your series was divergent at infinity and Borel transform, now it's convergent, but there are singularities at finite distance. Maybe they were infinitely close to infinity and Borel transform has put them at finite distance. But maybe in some case, it's not powerful. They are still uh, infinity close to the, the origin. So it means you need a, a stronger Borel transform. So maybe it needs, instead of dividing by factorial n, it would have been better to divide by factorial n power, power three halves or power two or power three. And that happens in life. I mean, that can very well happen. In fact, since we are not afraid of fractional powers, for instance, or even complex powers with this uh, framework, you can uh, define the Borel transform. So I define it always for integer powers or integer plus beta. But so imagine beta is one half. So I said it's well defined on that space. And it, it is also well defined on that space. So when you add them together, you get that. Uh, I don't need this. So, and so in fact, my Borel transform is well defined for Puiseux expansions of that kind. And in fact, any Puiseux expansion with, um, which is infinitesimal at infinity. And in, when, why do I say that? Imagine, imagine you started in the first variable and you were dealing with something which has this factorial 2n. And that was, but okay, let me, it's this. Or let's say one to make things. So then in that case, you need two. And so one way of saying it is, well, change variable. I mean, set Z1 to be Z1 half. Or Z, uh, Z uh, how do you want to call it? Z tilde. So now I change variable. And now I have factorial 2n, z till power, uh, am I right I'm saying that? Power z is z till power square, so now it's a 2n. Oh, then I'm done, I mean. <laughs> and, but maybe vice versa, maybe you, you had factorial n over two, I mean gamma of, and then it was not a good idea to divide by the factorial because it would make things convergent for sure, but now entire, you would see no singularity. So your Borel transform is too powerful. So in that case, it's better to use Z square. That's a more clever choice. And in that case, you would get this. And again, that would be more satisfactory. But now you need, you are happy to have a theory. I forgot the minus, I'm sorry. I'm seeing, thinking at infinity always. So you can play with change of variables, which amount to using different factorials uh, and so stronger or weaker Borel trans transforms, so to speak. Uh, yeah, it's sort of related. Uh, yesterday you defined the Euler series and you had a minus one to the end. Yeah. Uh, and that's what gave the Borel in the Borel transform, you got a one over one plus. Yes. So the pole was on the negative. Angle. Yes. But if I didn't have the minus one to the end, the pole would be on the real axis. Yes. So, but then you're not really changing the growth of the coefficient. No. But somehow then you're violating this condition. Yes. So. But look, at, I have choose, I have chosen theta to be zero here for the sake of simplicity. But Next blackboard, I will change theta, and, and then you are happy if theta is indeed we need. And then, so it means that there may be forbidden directions, and you are not the one to choose which. I mean, the series will tell, will tell you which directions are allowed and which are not, and that will have consequences for the functions you will construct. 
Yes, this was for the sake of simplicity to have a clear statement. So, I mean, for your intuition, zeta positive, so you see the growth. Yes. And so you understand that some, some kind of condition of growth at infinity is required. And what else? Some, some analytic continuation assumption. I mean, this is very important. This line must be free of singularity. In the case of the uh, negative Euler uh, series, the change of sign, I would have a pole at one, and I could not do that. I should do something else. I mean, I could do all the... Yes. Um, so this is one theorem. And then what do I want to say? Oh, more generally, uh, same statement, I mean, adapt, I mean, adapt a statement to the case. Well, I mean, one can adapt the statement for um, Z minus beta, sorry, zeta or minus, imagine it's not, there is a mild singularity at the region. So you can adapt the statement if there is a mild singularity. What you need is that singularity to be integrable. So you need real part of beta positive. And then you have the same statement, except that, uh, well, Borel inverse now will map these monomials, puis the monomials or whatever, to the, I mean, you have to correct the powers and, and remember the factorial story, which is replaced by a gamma function, etc. So I don't prove, I don't have no time to prove that, but it's an exercise in analysis uh, using very much that formula. So you can imagine, for instance, to truncate the Taylor series and to write explicitly the remainder. And if you do it properly, look in the textbooks, um, you can qualify the asymptotic expansion property. I said it has an asymptotic expansion property. So what does it mean, by the way? I should, I should write it at least once. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, so meaning of um, phi of Z has uh, asymptotic expansion sum of A and Z minus N. Or maybe there is a beta. Uh, what does it mean? It means that for every, what does it mean? Uh, for every n, there exists a constant C n such that when you truncate and you subtract this uh, truncated series, so you truncate at um, n minus one. Yes, n minus one. So the first term you neglect is minus capital n minus, and then I have real part of beta, something like that. Maybe you have to to be careful with uh, modulus of z to the power beta, uh, something of that kind, but uh, well, z is, z is complex, so it's not very safe. <laughs> um, it's better to put beta, I think to be on the safe side, I put a beta, but it's a detail anyway, it's just, uh, I could put a larger constant. What matters here is that when n increases, I improve the quality of my approximation, the error diminishes. That's the important. So that's the standard definition by Henri Poincaré. Uh, I think Henri Poincaré, 1893, uh, Les méthodes nouvelles de la mécanique céleste, volume three. I think that's the first formalization of that definition because Poincaré wanted to point out that astronomers are a bit careless when they manipulate formal series and geometers, that is mathematicians, have a different tradition. And he wants to make a point that 
Divergent series, you have to be careful, but they might be useful in that situation. So, but that is Poincaré asymptotics. Uh, I hope this is correct. So now here you have something better. Oh yes, I forgot something. I knew I, I was forgetting. I forgot to say that this is uniform estimate for real part of Z, uh, in that case, larger than some M1, uh, which is fixed in advance. So you fix M1 larger than M. And you, you, I mean, you need to restrict to a smaller half plane, slightly smaller. And then it's uniform. So it's a uniform control of the error for each N. But can you get some uniformness in N? Yes, you can in that situation. You have better than Poincaré asymptotics. It's even here, here. So that's the standard definition. Here we have one Gervre asymptotics, meaning that you can control this, these constants. The sequence CN can be chosen. One can take CN to be constant geometric factorial N that's consistent with uh, one Gervre for formal series. But this is one Gervre for asymptotic expansion. So it's a qual, yes, we have qualified this. Uh, asymptotic expansion property. So it's even better. And this is, this is true in the whole half plane, uniformly provided you have accepted to lose a little bit on the boundary of the half plane. Okay, so that's the meaning of asymptotic expansion property. So now let's vary theta. And... Um, Oh, I'm erasing these properties, but you may know that Laplace transform of um, minus zeta phi hat, this is a function of z which happens to be d over dz of the Laplace transform of phi hat. You may know that Laplace transform of convolution. So I mean, now, now I'm assuming they are convergent and both of them have analytic continuation in that half strip. So that formula, which was true locally for small enough, for zeta small enough, this is true also for zeta real positive, because then zeta one is positive, zeta minus zeta one is positive. So it makes sense. And you can check that it's true that uh, the Laplace transform of this product is the product of Laplace transforms, etc. So they are really, um, you, these properties, and what was the last one? The inter, yes, particular case when psi hat is uh, function one. Because yes, I didn't say it, but the primitive here, this is nothing but convolution with one. Convolution with one, psi one, psi hat is one. You, uh, but one in the Borel plane, not Dirac not the one of the Z variable. So I wanted to mention that briefly before erasing everything. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, here in this, this M prime greater than M, what is that M? Sir? This, say it again. In, in this, like when you're explaining this as asymptotic expansion, this sort of uh, description of what an asymptotic expansion is. The oh, is nothing to, oh, sorry. Very bad notation. This is K, okay, okay. This is your question. I mean, there, is a, there was a conflict. Uh, I had assumed M to be something here. Oh, yes. This is the same. Huh? This is the same. I mean, M, the growth at infinity, dictates the domain. So, you know, Borel Laplace, you exchange growth at infinity in the zeta plane for the domain in the Z plane. And uh, the asymptotic, ex the, the local behavior in the zeta plane at zero gives you the asymptotic at infinity in the z plane. And so, okay, so this is the philosophy. So this M here dictates the half plane. And of, I need, you need to reduce slightly your half plane instead of working 
So you are here. This is M, and you are working here. I mean, the function is defined here, and for any larger M1, you have very precise information in that half plane, but it's precise information, but relevant at infinity. But still, you may go to infinity uh, in those directions. This is why it's a bit clever. If you go vertically, uh, it's still true. I mean, it works. And so this, if you, if you try to write the proof by yourself, proving it in the sector, it's not a big deal. But getting the property also on vertical, this is a bit subtler. But it may, it may be done. Uh, so this was my M, real, the growth at infinity in zeta, the domain in Z, M and M1. And this Cn may be taken of the form a geometric term factorial length. And this geometric term, well, when you do the, the computations, this k will be a complicated function of m, delta, everything. I mean, this delta also will play a role. It's, I don't want to say what m is, and nobody cares. So um, just to clarify, uh, here you showed that uh, for the convergent series, the Borel transform must be an entire function bounded, but entire in this- uh, Of bounded uh, exponential type, bounded yes. Bounded exponential type. Uh, here it's bounded, but it's only bounded in that tube. Yes, the, uh, yes. That's the very- Yeah, and in between there is analytic continuation. So, which is very subtle because here I accept that maybe there is a, there are singularities. On, I mean, maybe the radius of convergence is finite, in which case there are singularities at finite distance, but none of them is in that tube, in that half strip. And this is what makes the, the big difference because of course I could apply this in the particular case where phi hat is entire of bounded exponential type in all directions. And then that would work. And what do you think I would get as a, as a result? What would be that function? It would be, be the, the ordinary thing. sum of the, of the series. I mean, if the series is convergent, Borel-Laplace pr produces the standard result. So it's the, in that sense, it's a good summation theory. It's a good summability theory because it, it reco you recover what you ought to recover in the standard case. And this is the theorem for one Gervais. Uh, and there will be analogs for other. Uh, yes, you could, you could modify the Laplace kernel to deal with uh, other situations, but I very much prefer change variables. I mean, what I do usually, I change variables, accepting possibly ramification, accepting fractional powers to always deal with standard Borel-Laplace. This is my taste, but I know that there is a book by Werner Balzer, uh, I think in the uh, 90s, and he's discussing uh, modifications of Borel-Laplace uh, for different growth orders. Okay. No more question. I mean, don't refrain from asking questions. I appreciate that. <laughs> it makes things more alive. <laughs> now I move Tita. Uh, and Tita is an angle, or maybe Tita is a real number because maybe there is this beta, which means that we are implicitly on the Riemann surface of the logarithm. And then, well, you can imagine that everything is the same, just rotated, but let me write it. So L theta of uh, A zero del Dirac plus phi hat is defined to be uh, this integral now. phi hat of zeta, big zeta. And um, so what is the condition? So we are doing things in, in such a 
hard strip centered on this ray. And we are assuming at most exponential growth at infinity for the analytic continuation, which is supposed to be defined here. But maybe there are obstacles elsewhere. And, uh, and then everything is the same, except that in the Z variable, you will have a rotated half plane. So you pick direction minus theta, and you have this half plane. So this is uh, M in the direction minus theta. And this is the half plane, real part of Z exponential I theta, larger than M. Indeed, this is the Euclidean standard product of Z and exponential minus I theta. If you view Z and if you, if you view complex numbers are, are point, as points in the Euclidean plane. So, I mean, this is supposed to be perpendicular. Okay, so we have moved uh, the um, direction. And a very important fact, uh, it's a theorem if you want. Imagine there is no obstacle here. Imagine, in fact, you have a sector free of singularities, not only half strips. Half strip is kind of the minimal you need, but very often in practice, you have sectors free of singularities. So imagine uh, you have this situation, theta one, theta two, and, and maybe you have some margin around your directions. I mean, take theta one or theta two slightly uh, uh, larger or, big or smaller, so that you have a, this situation. So now I'm assuming that my phi hat, which was uh, defined in a disk, has analytic continuation in this sector. Well, I can, yes, and I, okay, I'll do like that. And I have my assumption of analytic continuation plus bounded, I mean, growth controlled by uh, exponential. I assume that in the whole sector. And then you may do the same story in all these directions. So then the theorem is that, uh, so consider the interval. So here I have a closed interval from theta one to theta two. And so the theorem is one can define an analytic function. Let me call it Lj phi hat by gluing the L thetas, L theta phi hat with theta in J. But it is possible to glue, meaning that uh, indeed theta close enough to theta prime, close enough means the difference is less than pi. So it's not very close. <laughs> uh, this, um, and both of them being in, in J, so both of them are allowed, this will imply that L theta phi hat and L theta phi hat, L theta prime phi hat coincide on the intersection. I mean, this half plane, let me give it a name. So let me give a name to that half plane. So it's pi, capital pi, theta. And it depends on M, but M is fixed once for all. So we have a, a half plane which depends on theta. And now we are considering two nearby directions. We have theta, we have uh, theta prime. So we have theta, we have minus theta prime. And we have a different half plane. And the assumption here is just to ensure that they overlap. They have an intersection. So in that intersection, 
pi theta intersection pi theta prime, the two Laplace ones from coincide, and the proof is just by Cauchy theorem. And you can imagine, you consider a truncated Laplace, truncated Laplace to some big R, and this arc of circle, and you send R to infinity, and you use the assumption here to make sure that the contribution of the little arc, well, of, which is not so little, by the way, when R tends to infinity, but anyway, the contribution goes to zero. So it's easy to prove. But it's very important. It means now, now we have functions defined in sectorial neighborhood of infinity, not just half plane, but union of half planes, because all these half planes, you can glue them together. So the resulting function the resulting function. L j phi hat is analytic holomorphic in in the union of these phi theta. So let me call that union D D D j and asymptotic to the series. I mean the function has asymptotic expansion to um, B inverse phi hat, uh, phi hat, well, well, I'm forgetting A0 here. So well, A0 plus B inverse phi hat. There, I mean, same story. Um, you have a big domain now, it's a union. Well, it's how big is it? Uh, how big is it? I mean, here, if we forget about M, anyway, we go to infinity. So this boundary is a little bit like this line. Uh, I mean, it's, it's essentially direction minus theta plus pi over two. And that direction was essentially minus theta minus pi over two. So we had like a sector or slightly less than the sector of with that opening, opening pi. So now this domain is something like this. You have a direction minus theta one and minus theta two as uh, limiting bisect bisecting directions. So minus theta one is something like this. Minus theta two is something like that. And then this would be the picture. A big neighborhood of infinity, a sectorial neighborhood of infinity. And the asymptotic directions are minus theta two minus pi over two and um, minus theta one plus pi over two, if theta one is less than pi over two. And in all these directions, in, your function is well defined. So how is it defined? If you pick Z here, you need to choose theta such that real part of Z exponential I theta is larger than M. So you need to choose the direction uh, close enough to theta one. And if you move Z, the function is still defined, but by another formula changing theta. But all these formulas match. So this is an example of analytic continuation. So uh, this is important. Whenever you have a function obtained by Borel Laplace summation, automatically, automatically you have information in the domain of analyticity. I'm not saying this will be the maximal domain of analyticity. You still have possibility of analytic continuation outside of that domain. And maybe the Borel Laplace picture breaks down, but at least you have that. And that's already precious information. And moreover, you have the asymptotic expansion property. Okay. Uh, the sensible choice is I take the sector as large as possible, 
But maybe I cannot go beyond here or beyond there because there are singularities. So let me show you that in examples in a minute. So you will see the example of the Stirling series. It's a very clear example for that. Was that? Yes, this is my next, that I, what I had planned. But that, that was another question. Yeah, so it's essential that it's the same M, right? That whole uh, sector. If you want to write uniform things, it's convenient, but no, it's not essential. You can accept that M depends on theta, and you can define, yes, you can accept that. I mean, let, exactly. I mean, let me call this pi theta M, and let us assume that we have this property with um, M of theta. And then you are doing this. No problem. No problem. Uh, and what you need for M, I think I wrote it this way in my book. I said that M was a locally bounded function in the sense that uh, if you have, you don't, you don't even need M to be constant, to be continuous. Uh, you may accept M discontinuous, but you need that two nearby, in, in any neighborhood of theta, you, you can find an, a common upper bound. So what was the story of locally bounded? It's because when maybe you can have a singularity, uh, maybe you have M going to infinity when you approach theta one. And maybe you will take the open interval. So maybe you have a singularity here. And so this is theta one star. And so you cannot take uh, the closed interval, but you can take a better interval with uh, theta one star and the same story on the other side. And then you can define this with J open interval, no problem. If J is an open interval, so you cannot reach exactly that direction. And in that case, if you, have, if you do have a pole or any singularity there, very likely M of theta will go to infinity when you approach here. But that's not a problem because you can have a function defined on an open interval, which is locally bounded and goes to infinity at the boundary. So it's not an issue. Oh, yes. I mean, it's because I'm never pretending I'm manipulating the optimal constants. But in practice, yes. In practice, probably there are theorems about the, the optimal M here. The optimal M of theta certainly has some kind of regularity as a function of theta. But I never use the optimal M because in practice, it's so hard to, <laughs> to obtain. But probably there are results in complex analysis about the it's a standard topic for entire functions. Uh, imagine you have an entire function of bounded exponential type. So there exists M. And so you can ask, but in a given direction, what is the optimal M? And this has been studied, yes, for sure. So example of... Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes, it controls the, the, the shape. I mean... So this, this thing can be, can be wiggling like that. Yeah, yes, if M is a constant, you have a half line, an arc of circle, and another half line, yes. And with, uh, yes, if M is constant, it's, yeah. So you can always reduce the situation to M constant by reducing the interval and choosing a common upper bound. That's the safe solution, uh, the lazy solution, let's say. Um, but in general, yes, the domain is something. But the advantage of constant M is that now, now you have a clear statement about the asymptotic behavior at infinity. So the example of the Stirling series. Is even if M was constant. The, the shape of? Of this, uh, this boundary. Yes. Uh, if M is constant. Yeah, so it's a half plane like that. 
So picture yourself, the union of these half planes when, and this, this point, intersection of the bisecting direction with the boundary of the half plane is moving along a circle. And this is why I was mentioning this. This is my circle. Yeah. And, and then it's... That's it. Uh, example of the Stirling series. But it's very good to think hard on, on these questions and because the domain, I mean. Uh, so uh, the, um, what did I forget? Uh, I forgot something, yeah, but well, no, no problem. Mm -hmm. Well, before stealing, <laughs> before stealing, what about the conversion case? Imagine if I had, well, I mentioned it is if imagine it's entire uh, bounded exponential type, but it's good to write it. This uh, L J you, you can take in that case you can take J equal to zero to pi closed. I mean, and zero and two pi are, are the same in practice because pi hat is single valued, um, and then. This is a function of z, which is the usual sum of Borel inverse of phi hat. Okay, uh, now stealing. You remember this function? We had a, a, we had found, I had mentioned the existence of a formal series maybe starting with one twelfth, and then only odd powers. Um, the formula involves Bernoulli numbers. This is the standard, the usual stealing series. And I mentioned that it's Borel transform, not only is convergent, but is meromorphic. And there is a formula. I mean, what was it? One over zeta square? Zeta hyperbolic cotangent, zeta over two, maybe zeta over two. I don't know. I mean, you, that's fine. I mean, the important thing is that it's meromorphic. So you have two forbidden directions because the poles are on this uh, imaginary axis. So you have the picture in the in the Borel plane like this, two pi i, etc., and it's meromorphic, meromorphic poles, meromorphic in C, and the poles are on a two pi i z, except the origin. So at the origin we have a disk of convergence of radius to pi. So you are entitled to apply this theorem in any direction here, yes? And you can compute L minus pi over two. So here I will use the open interval, minus pi over two plus pi over two, phi, uh, mu hat, and I will get a function. And here you see that when I approach this, uh, I'm very close to this pole, and the, the M will grow. But how do I define that? I, do, I define it by taking compact intervals contained in minus pi over two, pi over two, on which I have a uh, bounded exponential type. And then I take uh, the union. But in fact, the story is simpler in that case. Because if I remember correctly, in the Borel, in the Borel plane, yes, um, how does it work? M is zero for any theta. So you cannot, yes, so in this case, 
you have no problem with M. This is the simplest case. Yes. Simply because the, yes, there are poles, but, but you never, if you go even very close to the pole, it's bounded. Well, the point is that the pole, you will feel it, but not at the exp in the exponential. You may have, when I say exponential growth, it's for, if you have power of zeta here, maybe a high power of zeta, I don't care. What matters is the, so in fact, M is epsilon for any positive epsilon. And this is why in the end, it's as if M were zero. So it's not exactly zero in the sense that there would be a, a polynomial growth, I suppose, because uh, I mean, when you are very close to the poles, you must feel something, but you don't feel it in the exponential. So this is why it's totally harmless. Well, now the picture is simple. In the Z plane, I'm gluing, so I'm starting with Laplace zero, I'm starting with this half plane, and then I increase theta, so I get uh, the, this other quadrant. And similarly, I can in, diminish theta and get the other, well, sorry, it was wrong. I mean, when I increase theta, I go this direction. <laughs> I mean, because of the minus here, remember, the minus theta, yes. So if theta increases, I'm using these half planes, and if theta decreases, I'm using these are the half planes. And in the end, I get everything but the negative semi-axis and the origin. So this function, so let me call J this interval, close, no, sorry, open interval. So LJ is, LJ mu hat is holomorphic there. And one can prove that it is equal to uh, logarithm of gamma, blah, blah, blah. It is equal to the function mu that I have defined the other day in this domain. And indeed, the function mu happens to be holomorphic there. It's not a new, it's not a new fact. Well, there is, you can view it as something new. I mean, remember, I, my starting point was Gamma of Z is positive for Z positive. So it has a logarithm. And I define the function mu like that on positive reals. And now I say, and I, I took for granted the steering formula. My function mu was tending to zero. Just that piece of information is sufficient to prove that mu coincides with that because of the functional equation. Um, Maybe I can do a little digression here because um, the previous part was a bit boring. I mean, these are general facts, but in practice, how do you work with that? I mean, my function mu of Z was defined as the logarithm of gamma divided by the steering factor. So it was defined uh, on R non-negative, R positive, sorry. And we took for granted that information that it tends to zero. So let me emphasize for real x. We just need that. And we need the functional equation. Well, gamma of z is uh, gamma of z plus one is z gamma of z, which implies that mu of z plus one minus mu of z is something you can compute. So compute it and you will see it's something very explicit. Let me call it z, chi of z and something very explicit. And it is of that form. It's, a, it's convergent at infinity uh, and it starts with order two. I like that very much because now I can say, well, this is a functional equation of which I know one particular solution and then a function defined for R pos for positive reals. Can I find a formal solution? So that's a digression, but that's a very important point of strategy. I'm faced with a function and equation. I'm interested in a particular solution. Can I find a formal solution to that equation? 
Yes, and moreover, Borel transform will help me to identify it and even to prove its existence because this now, now I insist I'm solving the form, the equation in the formal world, the formal realm uh, with uh, muted formal series without constant term. Well, it makes sense to say without constant term because the, the true function I want to analyze tends to zero. So if it were somehow related to a formal solution, that formal solution wouldn't have a constant term. So can I find a solution to that? Well, this is equivalent to uh, saying that exponential minus zeta Borel of mu tilde minus Borel of mu tilde is equal to Borel of chi. I mean, Borel is clearly an isomorphism between spaces of formal series. But, well, then, then there is a unique formal series solution, Borel muted. So, so you see, this is a priori, this is looked for, sought after in this space. Remember, um, Borel is isomorphism between that space and this one. So I did nothing by applying Borel. But I discovered that, yes, there is a solution and there is a unique one. It's Borel of chi. Let, let me call it, let me call it chi hat. It's chi hat of zeta divided by exponential minus zeta minus one. Which makes sense because um, chi hat, uh, chi hat starts with a zeta. And because this starts with z minus two and it's convergent so Chi hat is an entire function of bounded exponential type at infinity. So this chi hat is an entire function and I divide it by exponential minus zeta minus one. I do not create any singularity at the origin because chi hat vanishes at the origin. So I have found a unique solution which happens to be convergent Oh, so now I can play with my machinery. I can say, this is the one I have written here. I mean, when you compute chi hat, I told you chi of z is very concrete coming from the functional equation of gamma. And well, you have to analyze this difference operator on the stealing factor itself or its logarithm. But so you, you do that. It's, and then you compute the Borel transform and you find such a nice formula. I mean, you see uh, this exponential minus zeta minus one, you can factor out exponential minus zeta over two, and you will see the hyperbolic cotangent appearing. I mean, clearly you have a division by sign, hyperbolic sine of zeta over two. So this is how I got that formula by doing this. But now, I did something completely separate from this function. I mean, I just manipulated this functional equation. So I found a Borel function, a Borel image convergent. And I said, well, this Borel image, it has nice Laplace transform in this domain. So now I have computed a function, but what, how do I know that they coincide? I have not proved that. So did you follow me? Mu was defined like this as a function for X real. And Laplace of mu hat was defined as the Laplace transform of the Borel image of the unique formal solution. Why should they coincide at least for X positive? It's because when I apply Laplace transform to that equation, I find that this is a solution to the same equation. So, I mean, very important. Uh, if I have a formal solution of an equation and I apply Borel and then Laplace, I get an analytic function which solves the equation because you remember there is a formula for the Borel image of the shift operator and we used it. And there is a formula for the Borel image of this. I didn't write it, but I should have written it. I mean, the Laplace transform of that is clearly the Laplace transform evaluated at z plus one. So yes, this guy is holomorphic there. 
is a solution to my equation star, this difference equation. So now we have two solutions to the same difference equation. What can we say about their difference? Lj mu hat minus mu. So this d of z, well, d of x, the difference is defined only for x positive. I was very cautious with mu. So this difference is defined for x positive. And it satisfied d of x plus one equal to d of x by difference in the chi of z cancel. So it's periodic. This is a periodic function, but what is its limit? Mu of x tends to zero and Laplace transform at infinity, it has an asymptotic behavior and the constant term is zero. So this tends to zero. So it's a periodic function which tends to zero. So it is zero. I have proved that D is zero. I have proved that indeed this mu happens to be the Laplace form form of that. So incidentally, I have proved that mu extends. So if you remember, mu was the logarithm, mu of x was the logarithm of something. So this mu extends everywhere, so I can exponentiate it. And I have proved that gamma of z divided by the ceiling factor is the exponential of mu. So I have proved that gamma does not vanish anywhere, which was not so, obvious from the definition. So that's, I insist, not only you have asymptotic information, but you have also a domain and just the existence of a domain of analyticity sometimes is a valuable piece of information. So, okay, I was very fast maybe, but I want to tell something else. Um, uh, hello, yeah. What if you would have chosen the, um, the uh, integrator of the complement of this J? Like oh, you mean, why don't we use these directions? Sorry, these directions. Yeah. Would it give theta you prime. So we have a J prime, which is pi over two, pi, three pi over two. Yeah. Thank you for asking. That's a very good question. I would have gotten another cut plane. I would have gotten LJ prime of mu hat defined in a different domain? Well, because mu hat is meromorphic, I could compute exactly the difference by the residue formula. So it's an exercise, well, homework, do it. I mean, copy the right formula, compute the residue and compute the difference between them. I mean, this difference is non-zero, but well, be careful that one function is defined in that cut plane, the other function is defined in the other cut plane. So the intersection has two connected components. So the difference between Lj prime and Lj, well, this is not one function, this is a function in the upper half plane and another function in the lower half plane. And both functions, you can compute them using the residue formula. So do the computation, Remember that mu tilde is odd. Hence, mu hat is even. Mu hat is even. This implies that Laplace J prime of mu hat is nothing but Laplace J mu hat of minus Z and probably there is a minus here. So you see the formal series is odd. This does not mean that the Borel-Laplace will be odd, but well, uh, when you apply minus minus here, you get the other sum. And when you put everything together, you prove the reflection formula for the gamma function. When you put everything together, this is the end of the exercise, conclude that gamma of z, gamma of one minus z is uh, the well-known formula the, the, with the sine function. So, that's a very good exercise. Thank you for asking. I hope you will try. Uh, just a small comment here. Like, if you had defined this mu as the LJ prime mu, uh, mu cap, that will satisfy the same difference equation. Right? This. 
Yes, uh, but indeed, the difference of the Laplace transform is periodic, but it's non-trivial. So you have uh, this difference is periodic here. Well, a periodic function in the upper half plane analytic, it has a Fourier series containing only positive harmonics. And the other function, it is a Fourier series with only negative harmonics. But the point is that when you do the computation, you do it and you find, uh, I don't know it by heart, but you find, so let's say for imaginary part of Z positive, um, you find coefficients, I don't remember which one, M at least one, exponential. So what is a Fourier series for one periodic function? It's something like two pi I M Z. And this two pi I M, what is it? It is minus two pi I minus four pi I. It is the contribution of the pole at minus two pi I M. Remember, if you go upstairs, you need to use in the Z plane, you need to use theta close to pi over two. I mean, and so when you compute the difference, the difference stems from these singular points at minus two pi I M, but in the Laplace common, exponential minus, minus two pi I M Z gives you this. So you, what is, this is what you will find. The difference is a one periodic function, yes. And the residue computation will give you its Fourier coefficients. But there is a miracle in that case. You can add, uh, it's a geometric series and you recover the logarithm. You, I mean, probably it's something like one over M because it must be the logarithm of uh, the geometric series with the exponential, which gives you in the end, when you exponentiate the, the sign that you have here. Uh, my question was more like, uh, like this chi of z, it is fixed completely by the asymptotic expansion, right? This chi of z is fixed by the functional equation. This chi of z, you get it from, this new delta z plus I mean, gamma of x plus one is x gamma x. Exactly, yeah. This implies that mu of x plus one, there is a logarithm. So it will be mu of x plus something, and it's not only logarithm of x, you have the rest coming from the stealing factor. Uh, so you have, uh, this is chi, yes. <laughs> so this, you compute this chi of x from the definition of mu and from the functional equation for gamma. This is also obeyed by the asymptotic expansion at infinity, right? This well, it infinity. will, yes, this chi, you will find it in here. I mean, this, this is nothing but chi hat of zeta divided by exponential minus zeta minus one. So you find the Borel transform of chi divided by the exponential. And the Borel transform of chi is an entire function. This chi itself has uh, singularities at finite distance in the X plane or in the Z plane, but doesn't matter. It's convergent at infinity. The Borel transform is entire. Oh, it's already half past 12. Uh, this is the stealing example. We have clearly two, in that case, we have, well, opening pi here gives you opening two pi there. What will happen in the Euler example? It's, the, the residue computation would be simpler because there is only one pole, but the domain, may give you a headache if you are not familiar with multi-valued functions and Riemann surface of the logarithm. So, so maybe we can have a look at that quickly. Ah. You're right, but here, I was manipulating a function phi hat 
mu hat, sorry, this mu hat here was um, regular at the origin. So for it, for this function mu hat, you can take theta modulo two pi, because for for that one, she doesn't feel it if it's theta or theta plus two pi. It doesn't care. So in that case. Oh, let me think. Uh, yes, you're right, you're right, uh, you're right. I must be more careful than that. So what's the story? <laughs> yes, okay, uh, I see what you mean. You're right. Okay, you're right. And by the way, the by the way, what you are saying indeed is the explanation of a difficulty you might have when trying to do the exercise, because you will say um, j is minus pi over two plus pi over two. The resulting function in z plane is defined between arguments minus pi and plus pi. So maybe I should have yes. Okay, let me take. Uh, where can I write it? I mean, sorry, it's so messy. <laughs> okay, let's, you're right. There is a, a, a point here to be discussed. Absolutely. So the story is um, LJ. So, yes. So I said J is minus pi over two plus pi over two. So this results in the domain DJ, which is essentially, which is exactly in that case, because M is almost zero, arbitrarily close to zero. So you get exactly, on the Riemann surface of the logarithm, you get exactly this. No problem. And I said, let's take this J prime. And then what is DJ prime? Well, for the same reason, it will be exactly a sector, an infinite sector without any limitation. Uh, you can go arbitrarily close to, uh, to zero, I mean, the, on the Riemann surface of the logarithm. Uh, I view the Riemann surface of the logarithm as a, as a universal cover of C minus zero, so I can approach zero, so to speak. Um, and so what is it here? Let's be careful. Uh, so pi over two is uh, here and minus three pi over two is there. So here, this is minus pi over two. And so this is zero. And this is minus three pi over two. And I decrease until minus two pi. So this is what I find. And you, do, you can use that to compute what happens in the intersection. So compute, if you do the exercise, you can compute Lj uh, prime minus Lj of mu hat for argument of z between, or the intersection is between minus pi and zero. So you compute it downstairs and indeed, you will have contribution of the poles upstairs and they will result in, and you will find, you will find something, I mean, Fourier coefficients and exponential minus two pi i m z, defining a function periodic in the lower half plane. Yes. But you're right, if I choose, minus two pi plus j prime, minus three pi over two, minus pi over two. As I said, phi hat doesn't, mu hat doesn't care, 
but Z cares about it because I'm not speaking of the same sector on the Riemann surface of the logarithm. I'm speaking of another one, which is um, between uh, probably between zero and two pi. And that's what you should do if you want to compute the difference on the other half plane. And so, as I said, new hat doesn't feel the difference, but in Z you feel it. These are two different sheets of the Riemann surface of the logarithm, two different copies of the slit plane. And there are so much multivaluedness in the stealing factor, so it makes a difference in the stealing factor. And uh, yes, you definitely must be careful about it in order to get the right reflection formula in the end. <laughs> If not, you have a mistake by a sign or something. So absolutely, you're right. So this is how it can be explained in this situation. No, no problem with theta here, but still in the z-plane, there is. you have to be consistent. You must be consistent between z and z. So, well, it's already the end of my time. <laughs> well, but let, well, we were launched on multi-valued issues like that. I how, could mention, how much longer do you, do you sorry? How much longer do you need? Uh, Just five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Taking, using as an excuse the fact that there, ha there have been questions. But just five minutes. Um, what, did, what about Euler series? You remember phi hat of zeta was, what was it? One over one plus zeta. I mean, there was a pole at minus one. And by the way, this is the Borel transform of phi t, the unique solution of, I gave the equation in the t variable, in the z variable, it's, um, what is it, minus t phi over dz. I, I think there is a minus now. And um, a plus here and, um, here it's Z inverse. Well, in fact, you can check it immediately. Apply Borel. Zeta, I mean, minus D over zeta gives you multiplication by plus zeta, plus one. And here the Borel image is one. So indeed, uh, I mean, I'm doing this minus, minus zeta phi hat plus phi hat is one. So this is correct, yes, okay. So we started with a differential equation. We get a formal solution. We compute the Borel transform. What can we do? Oh, only one forbidden direction, only one. So I can use any theta, any theta in J now will be from say minus pi to plus pi. But I could use minus three pi to minus pi, why not? Except that that would have a consequence on the sector I'm using in the Z plane. So what is the sector in the z-plane? It's between, um, so minus pi gives, pi gives you minus, minus pi, but this minus pi is plus or minus pi over two, so it's minus three pi over two. And this minus pi gives me pi and plus or minus pi over two, I choose the plus. So I get this picture. So there is pi over two here, minus pi over two, but I can go, it's like that. So definitely this is in the Riemann surface of the logarithm in the Z variable, definitely. <laughs> but there is no problem. I mean, uh, what I'm saying is here, okay, for these directions in the right half plane, I get the cut plane between minus pi, uh, between um, zero and two pi, I guess. Mm, this, these ones give me between minus pi and plus pi, sorry. So yes, if I stop here at pi over two or at minus pi over two, so this, this arc gives me this part from uh, minus pi to plus pi. 
but I can go beyond or in both directions so I can extend that. So this is why in that case, my function has clearly two different branches on the left half plane. And this is why remember when I stated the theorem, theta and theta prime had to be close enough. I mean, you cannot say I take theta equal to this and theta prime there and they must coincide. No, be careful. I mean, the, we are speaking of dif, distinct sheets of the Riemann surface of the logarithm. There is no in overlap. There is no intersection in the Z plane, in the Z Riemann surface. So what happens here is that we have a multivalued function immediately with two branches in that part. And if you want to compute the difference, what will you get? Well, now you can, you have learned the music. Um, the Laplace transform that I'm considering here is the Laplace transform of the Borel transform of a solution to an equation. It is itself a solution to that equation, but it has two different branches. So both branches solve the equation. So the difference solves the homogeneous equation. The difference of the two branches must be a multiple of exponential z. And indeed, the difference comes from the singularity, the Laplace kernel at, with zeta equal to minus one gives you this exponential z. So when you do the residue computation, when you compute this difference, so you will get a constant because it's a simple pole, you will get a constant times exponential z. And, uh, okay, that's enough for today. <laughs> Thank you for your attention and for your questions. Great, let's thank David again for a nice talk. And um, in the interest of time, maybe we can take questions over lunch uh, since there have already been many questions. And yeah, we'll meet again next Monday at 11 or 11 Indian time for the next talk, for the final talk of the mini course. And then there'll be a seminar talk on Friday, August 5th at 11 o'clock.